Hello, and welcome to Undercover. This is the show that looks between the covers of books by Missoula area authors. And my name is Dave Polly. I'm director of the Missoula Public Library. This show is a joint production of the Missoula Public Library, Fact and Fiction Bookstore, and Missoula Community Access Television. And you know, it's really fun doing this show. We've been on the air for several years now, and one of the wonderful things about it is the people that you get to interview. And we've been on long enough so that we're now doing encores with people who have been, been here before are making a return visit, having written another book. And our guest today is one of those people, Dorothy Patton. Welcome to our show, Dorothy. Glad to be here. It's nice to have you back again. And this book, uh, Return of the Wolf, is your first effort at writing fiction, I understand. And you're mostly known for the many, many wonderful nonfiction informational books you've written for young people. So I want to ask you, First of all, what's the genesis of, of uh, fiction in your life here? How did that come about? Well, I've really enjoyed writing nonfiction for, well, it's been more than 20 years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always like a new challenge. So the nonfiction has become kind of something that's, that I, I know how to do. I pretty much approach it the same way. And it's always new because I'm writing about different topics and the information is new, but the technique is pretty much generally the same and so I wanted to try something different. I also felt that with fiction I could get across things that you can't get across with nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And what about, uh, you obviously have quite um, a good reputation with your publisher and in the, in the literary world, but what about making this jump? How did that come about as far as getting uh, published? Well, I wanted to do something on the order of this book uh, for a long time. Ever since the wolves started coming back into Montana from Canada, the very first wolf that came back was a lone female wolf. And I felt sorry for her because she was a lone wolf. And a wolf is a, is a pack animal. They live in family groups. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it just seemed like a wolf shouldn't stay alone. Um, and so I became interested in that, kind of followed the, the whole thing as it, as it progressed over the years and the wolves became successful. But I didn't want to write a book that had any human characters in it, because I felt I wanted to tell the wolf story from the wolf's point of view. And I didn't think that that was possible to get something like that published, because you normally, for children's book, you're supposed to have child characters, and there's supposed to be a lot of dialogue. And then Clarion Books, which has published many of my natural history books, came out with a book about a male deer, young male deer, called Long Spikes. And I saw the description in the catalog. It sounded like the same sort of thing I wanted to do with wolves. So I called my editor and she said, said she'd send me a copy as soon as the book came out. And I read it and it was pretty much the same style. I mean, it's a very different book from mine, mm -hmm. of course. But uh, I thought, well, if they could get that book published, maybe I can get the book on Wolves published. So it gave me the inspiration to actually carry out the project. Mm -hmm. and, and from your point of view as a writer, how, how was this different in terms of research or just the, the writing itself from what you have normally been doing? Well, in terms of research, I pretty much had the information because I had written um, two nonfiction books, one completely about wolves and one about dog behavior and how you see wolf behavior through your dog. Mm -hmm. So, And I'd also had a lot of experience with wolves, visiting uh, captive wolves and going for walks with Kwani, who's a well-known oh, local right. wolf. Yeah. Uh, so I felt like, like I had the, 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 the knowledge of course, when I was working on the book and I'd go on a walk with Kwani, I would really watch her or when I'd take my dogs out on the meadow and um, they, one of them is a really good hunter and I would watch the things that they would do and use some of that as an inspiration for what the wolves would do in my, in my story. But it's very different writing fiction from writing nonfiction because you don't have the kind of framework that you have in, the, in nonfiction and mm -hmm. it's really quite a different process and I could not have done the the book, I don't think, without the help of my critique group. Just about the time I got interested in writing fiction, I got a phone call from Jeanette Ingold uh, saying that she and Peggy Christian were starting a, a critique group and would I like to be in it. And I never felt that I needed that kind of help with my nonfiction works, but right. I jumped at the chance to uh, be a part of that group because that way I was able to get input from other people into what I was doing. What kind of things did they tell you? that? Oh, they you. told me what was wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, that's what critique is. Yes, right, but also what worked. I think uh -huh. that's a key thing for uh, any kind of critique group is uh, that you let the other people know both what works and what doesn't work, or I, rather I should say what doesn't work and what does, because a lot of times 
critiquing is looked upon as purely as criticism. But um, in our group, we, we make an effort to, to do both, and, and it really works well. Mm -hmm. So they would, like if a scene was uh, needed to be expanded or if something was too long, I think pacing in this particular kind of book was the hardest thing for me to know just how long and how much detail and so forth to present something. Mm -hmm. And what do you think the intended audience for this book is? I mean, I, when I read it, I didn't feel like it in any way was condescending or anything like that. But did you have in mind an age group for, the, for this? Or does your, does your, your publisher? Or? Well, I think the book is uh, rated for ages 8 to 12 or ages 9 and up, something like that. But um, when I write, when I write for children, I always view them as readers who just don't know that much about a particular topic. Um, I think good, all good children's writing is not condescending because yeah. there's nothing to condescend to. I mean, a child is an intelligent human who happens to not have the information and experience and vocabulary of an adult. So a book like this has perhaps shorter paragraphs, uh, shorter sentences, and a simpler vocabulary than a book that's aimed at, at adults would have. Mm -hmm. But other than that, and the length, of course, is not terribly long, but other than that, you know, there's the, the, the sophistication of the information that, that comes through about wolves is every bit as much as it would be for, mm -hmm. for any reader. So I think adults, you know, can enjoy um, the book as well as children. And certainly my nonfiction books, um, I sometimes call crypto adult books because they're a great way for an adult right. to get a capsule summary of of a particular aspect of nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and also when I was reading it, I thought about the fact that you, in some sense, you're working within a, a rather long tradition of, of books for young people that tell a story from an animal's point of view. But it seemed like a lot of it that I read as a child was, a, was um, pretty much over-sentimentalized or very much um, giving the animal some human characteristics that they don't really have. Uh, how did you avoid that in, in, in this kind of thing? Well, it's very tempting to, to be um, anthropomorphic, to give but human qualities the to, yeah. the, to the animals. Um, and there were times when I slipped into that because I really got into the, the, the feelings of my, my main character that's a female wolf. Um, but whenever I did that, my, my friends and my critique group and the couple of wolf experts who read the book for me uh, nailed me on those. And then there were a couple that actually did make it through to the editor, and she caught those. So I think that uh, um, other people helped to keep me on track in terms mm -hmm. of that. Because mm -hmm. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want right. to be anthropomorphic. I think that, that just by describing the way the wolves live, you develop a, a, a positive feeling towards them. And you can see that they, are, they do feel emotion. Um, in their in their lives because they are family oriented and very much so and so you don't but you don't need to say it mm -hmm. it comes through by the things that they do the way that they behave rather than what my words you know say about them mm -hmm. and, and you did have some I think powerful and difficult scenes in there that there's the scene where the female wolf gets her foot caught in a trap and has to chew off part of her foot to get herself free and then where one of the four pups uh, is killed in a hunt. Uh, did you did you think about um, writing those in a way that wouldn't traumatize anybody, or, or how did you how did you approach that? Well, the the female getting her toes caught in the trap was partly inspired by the fact that I think it was the second wolf that came down from Canada into Montana was missing a toe, and had probably been caught in a trap, mm -hmm. and that was actually a male wolf that ended up mm -hmm. uh, being the alpha wolf in the first pack. To, uh, that, they, that they tracked around northern Montana. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other scene um, was a real difficult thing to do. When I first wrote it, he didn't die. He just was oh. severely injured. Oh. And we went around and around, my critique group and my wolf expert friends and I, about whether or not we should leave it the way, I, sh I should leave it the way it was or whether I should change it. And because a lot of times, you know, young wolves don't make it. and, mm -hmm. and being a wolf is very difficult. You, you need to, um, to hunt animals that are well able to protect themselves. And that was one of the things I wanted to do in this book, too, was to dispel the image of deer and other prey animals as helpless, sweet things, because they're not. If they were, they wouldn't exist. They have to be able to fight off their predators. 
and deer often do. And so finally I came around to the decision that, yeah, I was going to have to kill off one of those little guys, and I didn't want to do it. <laughs> it, it. It hurt me to write yeah, that. It was painful. Seeing yeah, it was, and, it, and, and my group didn't like it either when they heard you know they heard they heard it they didn't like hearing it but they knew it was better that way because more often than not you know all the wolves in the pack don't make it right yeah so that's just a normal part of uh, life for growing up a wolf is there's a risk of getting hurt or killed even by the prey you're hunting yeah and like nine times out of ten when wolves check out prey uh, they do not make a kill. Right. So it's a very difficult thing to actually be able to, to bring down that, that prey, and the young and experienced wolves are the most likely ones to, to die in the process because they don't have, so much of what they do is learned behavior, and they just right. haven't learned the ins and outs of, right. of how to, to hunt safely. Yeah, the, in fact, you described quite a bit of description about these, these pups learning to hunt. And they made a lot of mistakes. I mean, that was interesting to me to see that there isn't some something instinctive that that they know exactly how to proceed. That has to be learned. I think that's one thing that makes wolves so successful. The wolf, other than the human, the wolf is the most uh, has the widest range, natural range of any uh, any mammal in the world. Mm -hmm. And one reason is because so much of their behavior is learned. So wherever the wolves live they learn how to survive in that environment and how to hunt the kind of prey that exists there. So that's, that's really a secret of the wolf's success is that, yeah. that learning. Did you, well you obviously described very well the setting. Did you have in mind Montana or did you have in mind some specific place or was this a made up setting composite of some kind? Well it was a, it, I did have in mind Montana and the kind of landscapes that we have in northern Montana. Um, I didn't have any exact spot in mind. I did visualize the area that that I created. When I when I was writing about it, I could see it. I could see the big river, which would really be the uh, the North Fork, and I could see the logging roads and the meadow and the stream going through the meadow and so forth, but it wasn't based on any one particular place, just on the kinds of places that I've seen myself, you know, living here. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I want to talk a little bit about the whole issue of wolf recovery and all that, since it is a controversial thing in Montana. And I'd like to get your take on, on how, you, how you feel about it. And particularly, um, how do we balance the need between wildlife and humans? And where do you stand on all that? Well, of course, it's not a surprise to, to, for you to hear that, that I believe wolves belong in Montana. I mean, they're part of the natural system. And if you go to Yellowstone, you can see what has happened there because of a lack of, of predators, particularly for the elk. Um, and it's, I think the ecosystem will be much healthier with the presence of wolves. However, I also feel that if wolves develop the habit, any wolf that develops the habit of uh, eating livestock is going to have to be eliminated. I don't like the idea, but I think it's the only way that's, that's fair um, because the ranchers also have um, a lifestyle to pursue as well as the wolf having a lifestyle to pursue. And I'm very glad that there are compensation funds that allow for, for ranchers to be compensated for, for the loss of livestock. But already, the m number of livestock that are lost to uh, coyotes and, and uh, dogs that get loose and uh, trucks on the highway are much larger than the number of livestock that, would be, that are likely to be taken by wolves. So it would be a small factor um, in, the, in the whole equation of, of stock growing mm -hmm. in Montana. And Wyoming. And from what I've read, now help me with this, that there are very few, if any, documented cases of wolves attacking humans in anywhere. Well, and as far as North America goes, there is not a single documented case of a healthy wild wolf ever attacking a human being. Um, and I think perhaps the reason for this is that we came in and pretty much eliminated the wolf by the end of. Mm -hmm. uh, of the, of the 19th century, and the wolves that did survive were wolves that were terrified of humans. Mm -hmm. And so they don't really, really come around humans, and the wolves in Canada don't. The Yellowstone wolves didn't even want to leave their pen because they'd have to go past this area where there'd been so many humans. They had to open a new place 
in the, in the pan for them to, to leave because mm -hmm. they were so uh, averse to, to getting near a place humans had been. So I really think that we're not going to have too much trouble with these animals myself. And whether or not wolves ever killed people in the villages back in Europe in the old days is irrelevant to the fact that the kind of wolves we have now on this continent are very, very shy around people and avoid them at, at all costs. What about from the other side? Is this wolf recovery program going to be successful? The wolves that we're trying to introduce, say, into the Selway and into Yellowstone, is that going to work, do you think? I sure hope so, and I, I think it will, because they are very adaptable. They're very, uh, there's lots of food for them, lots of uh, elk and deer, and they are, you know, as I say, they're, they're such an adaptable species, so, and it is a natural environment for them. So unless people start, you know, s sneaking in there and killing them off, they should be able to recover very well, and I, of course, I have no idea how long it will take. Nobody does, but uh, I'm real confident that the the process will be successful. Is there a possibility if that works out to go beyond that to other areas of the country? Or are there any, really, are there enough areas with enough habitat? I don't know about that. Yeah, well, in Minnesota now, there are 2,000 wolves living in northern Minnesota. And I think um, a measure of how successful, how successfully wolves could live with people, something like 1 to 2 percent of stock growers in, in Minnesota have had problems with wolves, even though the state is, the northern part of the state is pretty much saturated with wolves. And they are being reintroduced either by themselves or by, by agencies into uh, northern Wisconsin and I think possibly parts of, of Michigan as well. Mm -hmm. So there are other states that are interested in this and they're also trying to work out a way of having the Mexican wolf, which naturally lived in Arizona and New Mexico and parts of Texas, I think, as well, um, into that area, but there's a lot of opposition to that, right. so I don't know how successful that reintroduction will be. Is there danger from illegal poaching and trapping? Uh, obviously, I think this description that you had in the book, this guy, there was one human, very shadowy type, and that he was doing something that was probably not legal. Well, though they're tra I think that the trapping is still allowed in Montana, I think, um. and uh, certain, I don't know that much about it, but People can set trap lines for certain kinds of animals that they want their, you know, for fur. And I think it's still allowed in Montana. Mm. Um, and a wolf, you know, could get caught in a trap um, that's set for other animals. That yeah. would be a risk that, yeah. that, that they would face. What about poachers, people who will go out and shoot wolves maliciously? Is that a, a big problem, do you think, or not? Probably not, because they'd have a hard time finding the wolf to shoot it, yeah. because the wolves are going to hide out in, in Europe. Wolves have survived not because people have have allowed them to survive, but because they become invisible, mm -hmm. and by this, their their shyness and their and their behavior, you know, avoiding humans. There, people live around wolves and don't even know there are wolves there. So the hope is that the same thing will happen to the wolves here. That the the ones that know how to stay away from people are the ones that will survive. And if any of them get in trouble with people and are killed, they won't reproduce. So we can help help that process along by mm. eliminating wolves that do harm humans, even if, you know, it hurts, hurts us to, to think of having to do that. And what, what would be your hope for a, a, a young reader? What would they take away from this book, do you think? Mainly a respect for the wolf and a feeling for what a wolf is. I really try to convey, I convey my concept of what a wolf is. And of course, you know, who knows, who can ever say whether whether my concept is the same as, as reality, but um, I feel like I've had enough experience with them to come somewhat close to the idea, and also to have a respect for the whole ecosystem and how different animals live together within it, and that prey animals like deer are not helpless, that they are able to protect themselves, and that they are strong, and that perhaps the predators help keep them that way by chasing them and by eliminating the, the ones that, that aren't smart enough or strong enough to escape. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about other projects you're involved in? Do you, do you see yourself writing another uh, fiction, work of fiction? Or not? Well, right now, in my, I'm working on a, a fiction work that has no animals in it, and it has humans that actually carry out dialogue and talk and whether or not it will be successful, I don't know. But I'm getting a lot of help from my critique group with that particular project. 
and I've worked on a couple of picture books for kids, you know, the, the right. kind of book where you have just a few words and then you have a lot of illustration. Mm -hmm. I have two of those, and both of those do have animals in them. And in my head, I have plots for at least three different novels that have people and animals in them. So mm -hmm. if it all works out, in between the times I'm working on my nonfiction, I'll have plenty to keep me busy. Sounds like it. Well, I know that you do school visits and, and talk to kids. Uh, what sort of questions or responses do you get when you do that sort of thing? Well, kids, kids want to know where I get my ideas. Mm -hmm. And my problem is not so much getting ideas as figuring out which ideas to focus on, because I'm always having ideas. They often flow from, like the book idea for this book flowed from my doing the nonfiction books on wolves and from reading the papers about wolf recovery. Um, and uh, they want to know what's my favorite animal, which is an impossible question to answer. <laughs> but I'll, I'll often give in and say the wolf, <laughs> because uh -huh. uh, it, it is an animal I have special, especially strong feelings for. And they want to know what is my favorite book that I've written, and that one is to totally impossible to answer right. because yeah. what my photographer that I work with on a lot of books, Bill Munoz, always says is my favorite book is the one I'm working on right now. Right. Yeah. So, so I think that's a pretty good answer. Do you get a sense that children are better educated about wildlife and the issues that surround it than they used to be? Or oh, I think so. Of? When I was a kid, uh, there weren't books like there were books, fic fiction books available for children about animals, but as you pointed out, they were often very sentimental mm -hmm. and not ter particularly accurate as to the way the animals really lived. Right. Nowadays, uh, well, and they were also were not the kind of nonfiction books that I write available right. when I was a child. And now there's lots of authors out there who are doing high quality, accurate books with wonderful f photography to educate children. And kids really care about the environment. And they have a different attitude. They think about, what can I do, even as a child? You know, mm -hmm. how can I help raise money for the children's rainforest? Or, or you know, I, what can I do to help my family recycle things? And th th things like that that we never thought of when we were children. My, my uh, sons in their 20s have already donated money to, to uh, charitable causes, environmentally concerned charitable causes, which is something that never entered my mind when I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah. So I think that there's a lot of hope for, for knowledge and concern and sense of responsibility in kids these days and what they'll carry through as, as adults. Well, that's good to hear. And your writing is probably part of the reason. I think you can take some pride in that. Well, thanks. I, I, I hope that's true. I'm I would sure like to feel is. I have some positive influence. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being our guest. The book uh, is Return of the Wolf by Dorothy Patton. You'll want to check that out at your local library, probably, or your local bookstore. I would like to have just a few minutes here to talk about some things at the Missoula Public Library. But before I do, um, I'm wearing this button. Maybe you can't see, but it says Library Advocacy Now, our national organization that uh, those of us that work in libraries are part of, the American Library Association, has asked us to be especially active as advocates for libraries during this this coming year, and so that's one of the things I'm trying to focus on, and they've provided us with some help, information, things that we can do to be library advocates and to recruit others to be library advocates. In fact, I recruited Dorothy Patton to be library advocate. She's now a member of the Missoula Public Library Foundation Board. I almost forgot to mention that. I'm glad I did. So she's, she's being an active library advocate. They've provided us a few facts about public libraries, which I think are interesting to to share, um, the average um, American checks out six books a year from a public library. And um, we spend an average of about $18 a year in taxes for public library service. But in Missoula, we spend $9 a year for that. So we're half the national average. Uh, we spend, Americans spend $330 billion a year on legalized gambling. That would be enough to support public libraries for the next 75 years. So it gives us a little, little sense of perspective about where our priorities are. And public libraries receive less than 1% of all tax dollars, but we are used by more than 50% of the population. And finally, a little plug for our upcoming summer reading program that will be starting in June, and we always have a lot of kids involved. More children participate in summer reading programs at libraries than play Little League Baseball. So there are some... Uh, 
some interesting little facts for you about public library service. And I want to emphasize, in addition to our upcoming summer reading program, we have our ongoing story times three times a week for preschoolers. We have two new programs going on. Every Thursday, we have something called Chapter by Chapter, where we read aloud to school-age kids every Thursday at 4 o'clock. So you'll want to get your kids involved in that. Reading aloud is fun, both for the reader and the hearer. And also, we have a twice-a-month new program called Brown Bag Book Browsing, where at noon, we bring out a whole bunch of new books, and people can come in. That's the first and third Thursday at noon, and people can come in and take a look at what's new and noteworthy at the library and check them out right on the spot if they want to. And we'll have a library staff person give a little synopsis of the books that are available. Again, I want to thank Dorothy Patton for being our guest. And I'm looking forward to your third visit and however <laughs> long that takes to get you here. And uh, let me again give you the name of the book, Return of the Wolf. Thanks so much for being with us on Undercover. <laughs>